Hello, my name is Lizzie Karen and welcome to the channel I've created on my dreams of Atlantis. This episode is about the forgotten history of humanity before the deluge. It's part one because the story is quite a long story and much as I've tried to abbreviate it, it's going to take two episodes for me to get through it all. So it's the story of humanity as I've pieced together from my various regressions, so my my dreams at night, and um, well, this is it. Humanity began in the same way as all the animals. We evolved, partly due to luck, selective pressures from our environment, choices of our ancestors, and of course the genetic accidents that gave us the advantages to become us. Our earliest ancestors came along, well, they came a long time after the dinosaurs, so we were lucky enough to do most of our evolving at a time after those large and very dangerous predators had been wiped out. But there were lots of other hurdles for our ancestors to get over. Changes in our world, caused changes in our environment. Our ancestors therefore went through environmental pressures that caused them to adapt and they did that successfully. For example, when the water levels on the planet were higher, our ancestors spent a lot of time in the water, losing most of our body hair in the process. Our ape-like ancestors took about mm, six million years before they started to resemble a fully formed human with opposable thumbs, big smart brains and the ability to vocalize words and eventually becoming humans. Mankind, or as scientists today say, Homo sapiens, eventually arrived fully formed about 300,000 years ago we had evolved into who we are today. But as smart and hairlessly good looking as humanity was, nothing much changed for hundreds of thousands of years because the lifespan was only sufficient for reproduction and survival. The story of Atlantis does not start at this point, not, not at the beginning of humanity, because the beginning of humanity was well, fairly uneventful. Humanity evolved, discovered fire, created tools, lived in communities, developed a bit of language, etc., etc. I'm sure you've all heard those stories. Now it gets exciting at a later point. Humanity started on a path to civilization many times, but our warring nature and our argumentativeness held us back. And, um, we were spread thin around the world in small communities of what are described today as hunter-gatherers. Life was tough, life was short, and life had very little meaning other than survival. No formal written language meant that our knowledge could only be transferred from one person to another by memory. Our ability to sing developed at this time as it was the primary tool for remembering and passing information on to others. A person's life was very simple. You were born, you learned survival skills from your parents, chose a mate, had children, raised children, then died. And that was the lucky ones. There were so many dangers everywhere. Progress for humanity was very slow. Hunter-gatherers became farmers, Farmers started trading with each other, etc. But written language started to appear and with it, knowledge could be more easily transferred from one generation to the next. Each generation was able to build on the knowledge of the previous generation. And then it would be gone in a flash, over and over. But progress was slow because lifespans were short. A person had just got to grips with what life was all about when suddenly it was all over and it was the turn of the next generation to continue to try to do better. And so the natural disasters or fighting between groups or within groups would put humanity back 
to a previous level, or, or at least delay them. Superstition also played a part in holding people back because anyone who came up with a really good idea was often not accepted and that would be for superstitious or religious reasons. Oh, and don't get me started on religion. We'll just ignore that for now. Humanity ebbed and flowed for thousands of years, moving to different lands, experiencing different dangers and somehow surviving. One group of humans became slightly more successful due to their unified culture. Everyone supported each other and as the culture evolved, it became stronger. Dangers came and went and the culture persisted. Without infighting, dogmas or power scuffles, the culture was able to focus on language, knowledge and learning. And it was into this unique environment of acceptance that Uran was born. Had he been born into one of the other cultures at around the same time, his genius would not have been tolerated. Most likely he would have either been killed or exiled. But it is at this point in time that the lost history of Atlantis really begins. So it was very fortunate that Uran was born into the culture that was to become the Tantals, or Atlantis as it is known today. The proto-Tantals already had a unique human environment before the arrival of Uran, as I mentioned, because infighting had been eliminated and they were a very peaceful people whose success depended on the care they had for each other. There were no superstitions, no belief in super beings, the people of Tantal thought that other human groups were a little bit crazy to believe in invisible things. That caring, combined with the ability to stay out of the way of the other human groups, who were mainly nomadic and had a terrible tendency towards violence, plus their uh, general acceptance of the benefits of change, put the proto Tantals in the perfect position for what would happen to them next. Especially since they already had a written language and retained knowledge in books, so they were well ahead of the other human groups at the time. Then, as I said before, one day everything changed when an exceptionally intelligent child was born by the name of Uran. To him, the things the adults taught were self-explanatory easy and obvious. It was not long before he had read every book and learned everything the adults knew and was working out many things himself from scratch. He realized that the biggest problem he had to resolve was that all the people and animals had a built-in obsolescence, which he must resolve if humanity were to live long enough to progress. Before the age of 20, he had already invented many machines. He had even clumsily managed levitational flight and had resolved many health issues in the population. So he'd improved health in a person's lifespan, but this was no longer enough for Uran. He wanted everyone to be young. He hated to think of losing his parents and his last remaining grandparent. So his focus went on longevity. Only being able to extend life expectancy was just buying time, and his greater achievement was yet to come. He discovered a trigger in the genetic structure of all people and animals that caused aging and eventual death. Once he had the key, he knew what to look for to fix it. Anyway, um, there's a lot more of that on my other episodes, but he achieved his fountain of youth. Before the creation of the cure, which is how it was known, a person would get old enough to be good at something, then die, often without passing on the skill they had mastered. So living longer meant that not only did a person fully master their skills, they had time to become active in passing on that knowledge, sharing ideas, and developing fields of study and knowledge. People still died, 
after getting the cure, but they didn't die of old age. They had accidents or medical issues. Many of these things were reduced significantly as more knowledge grew. The Tandhals were later to be known in myth as immortals, but this was not true. They could die, but they just didn't die of old age. Life became less stressful, more fulfilling, and change was constant. New things were being discovered at every turn. Everyone appreciated what Uran had kicked off for them. There were no dissenters at this time. Everyone was on this roller coaster ride of discovery and development. The outside world still had the hunter gatherer communities, but Uran's people had as little as possible to do with them. His next focus was as a result of the longer lives. People lived long enough to keep learning, so learning became his next focus. He created the Great Institute at the same time as he built the new city of Tantau, which became known as Atlantis. Our people moved to the new location once it was complete, and everyone loved it. Well, nearly everyone. Uran became the leader of his people because the previous leader just decided it was best for everyone that way. No disputes, no debate, it just happened. And upon becoming the leader, Uran gave his laws to the people. To find out more about that, you'd need to see the episode on the laws of Uran. So setting up the university, i.e. the Great Institute, was a great success, but it wasn't big enough. So his next step was to split the Great Institute into 12 fields of study and knowledge. He did this with the help of some of his students. From this platform of knowledge and learning, science and technology developed rapidly. But people were still having lots of children and the resources of Tantel had not been set up for such an increase. So Uran decided to limit the number of children to one child per lifetime. To make sure of it, he adjusted his aging formula to remove their ability to reproduce without his assistance. Some people from Tantau left at this point, but many of those actually returned. Even the most vocal protester of the policy of one child per person eventually accepted that it was put in place to prevent overpopulation. As people were living an unlimited life, Uran believed it was irresponsible to have such long lives without the control of reproduction. The population still grew, but it was at a much more manageable pace. So to summarize to this point, the key to the greatness of Tantal under Uran was longevity, language, education, respect for each other, respect for the planet, no conflict internally or externally. And this was true for over 9,000 years, which is pretty good going really. So Uran, well, he ruled for nine, about 9,300 years, and it was only in the last few hundred years that people started to really grumble. But it, it was really minor grumbling compared with what the rest of humanity had to contend with at the time. But this was the grumbling that loosened Uran's hold of Tantel. Uran had kept control for such a long time because he was loved by the people and he had control of their longevity. So should anyone step out of line for any reason, they were not punished in the traditional sense. Instead, they would be transported to live in the wild land with the primitive hunters and farmers that lived there. They would then live a normal length of life um, many took wives from the primitives or husbands and had, had as many children as they wanted. Um, well, after all, they were just human, just like the primitives. Uran was a good leader who only wanted the best for his people. 
But he feared that the people were not good at determining what was good for them, even after being so well educated. But life was good. During the time of Uran, there was no personal wealth, no personal aggrandizement, except maybe Uran, but only a little, and no desire for unnecessary material items. If somebody wanted something, they simply got it. As long as they played their part in society, there was nothing they could not have. And yet the people asked for very little. They were very happy and fulfilled with what they did have. No person could do better than any other, because if one person received something, another could then just go and ask for it and would get it just the same. As technology progressed further, there were no menial jobs. Any jobs considered menial were done by machines, for example, the mining. All roles for people provided a good level of satisfaction and enjoyment. And if a person ceased to enjoy their role, they could just request a change and they would be reassigned to something else that they wanted to try. So not only was life simpler, it was also very satisfying. Uran did not want anyone else to take control and spoil this perfect world that he had so lovingly fashioned. So he kept a very tight rein on his most important inventions. So that would, was longevity and some of the more dangerous machines. Things became very stressful for Uran when the grumblings got stronger. It was so disturbing that Haya, his wife, wanted him to stand down and leave Tantel, just retire. But Uran would not. After many years of Haya begging him, he agreed that he would eventually retire, but not until he was sure that the people no longer wanted him. And once he had prepared a place for his next stage of life. But the years dragged on. Behind the scenes, Uran worked tirelessly on his secret location, but he kept all his secrets very close to his chest. Most of the complaints about Tantal centered around the laws. There were three or four major issues that the people had. The non-interference rule with the primitives, the rule of the one child, the control over travel, and the control over exchange of knowledge between universities. The Cantals thought that they should have more freedom than they currently had. Eventually, Bella of Kron, one of Uran's most trusted students, and in fact his own son from before the time of Tantal, made an agreement with his mother, Uran's wife, Haya, and they decided it was time for him to stand down as leader. And so they conspired to oust him. But they both believed it was in the best interests of Uran and of Tantal. Bela got a large number of people to go with him to the Great Institute. And when Uran came out, they were in the process of pulling down his obelisk with the laws of Uran carved into it. It was all over when the Great Obelisk fell. Uran cried when he saw Haya in the crowd as well. He walked back to his home, packed up his things, and left Tantal forever. Haya knew where he was going, and she gave him a few days while she sorted out a few things, and then she followed him. It's not clear how long it took for him to forgive her, but eventually he did. Uran's quiet disappearance was the only indication that he had stood down as leader. Many of the people were devastated and many of those chose to leave Tantal. It was prophesied that Uran would only leave when the rather phallic representation of all that he had achieved, his great obelisk, was destroyed. Uran was clearly devastated. He later said that he felt like he'd been castrated. But the prophecy was fulfilled, even though it was essentially a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the people wouldn't have pulled the obelisk down had it not been for the prophecy. 
Anyway, retirement for Uran was pleasant enough. He still had much to do, so it was not as bad as he thought it might be. But that's going to be another story for another episode. Well, that is the end of part one. And in part two, I will tell you about the two leaders who came after Uran. We'll go over the Great Tantal Revolution and the war against Athens and finally what happened in the Great Deluge. So subscribe to the channel and click the bell if you want to be notified of the arrival of a new episode like part two. Thank you everyone and see you next time. Bye.